Don't leave that in. Take that out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and if you've been listening to these episodes for any length of time, then you know that I like to do lessons from CEDH. CDH is a metagame within the Commander format that sits at one extreme with highly consistent, highly efficient decks. And while not all cards are equally powerful in all formats, or even in all metagames, there are lessons to be learned from how players are using some of the most powerful cards in Magic's history. Today, I'm going to step back from the usual fare that we offer, as I'm going to do an episode that is actually entirely unscripted. And I want to show you that over the past couple of days, the time that I normally use to record and edit has been spent doing a little bit of upgrading. And with the power of editing, you can see that this lovely gemstone caverns behind me is actually just a green screen. And over the past several days, I have been setting up this little recording studio with all of these nice acoustic panels to try to make things sound a little bit better for all of you at home. So if you're enjoying these episodes, please be sure to check out our sponsor, FusionGamingOnline.com. They're your source for all your gaming needs. And one of the things I'm going to talk about in this episode is a deck which recently got a nice little upgrade that I ordered from Fusion Gaming. You'll have to make a guess down in the comments as to which deck that was. Although, if you know me, and if you know the decks that I've talked about before, it probably won't come as too much of a surprise for you. And I got to save money once again by using the discount code which is on your screen and down in the description. So be sure to use the discount code to save some money on cards you are going to buy anyway. That's FusionGamingOnline.com, your source for all your gaming needs. And today, one of the things I really wanted to talk about was, well, why CDH? Why lessons from CDH? Why am I doing this about a format that really was designed to be very casual and not a format that's really supposed to foster competitive gameplay? Well, one of the things that I really found appealing about CDH was playing with some of those most powerful cards in Magic's history. But something that I've really come away from, and the reason that I like to do these lessons from CDH, is because a lot of those lessons that I've learned playing CDH have informed how I go about my deck building, both in CDH and outside of CDH. So, if you don't mind hanging out with me for a little bit, I'm going to talk about some of my decks that I've built over the years. And we'll talk about a few of these, and I'll make sure that, well, there won't be too much editing in this episode, I am going to make sure that I include a large version of these different commanders that we're talking about. And the first one I want to talk about for just a couple of moments is a deck that I talked about after our Ark of Jeskai, where I started building a deck around Nissa of Trocken. Now, in Jeskai month, I had used the opportunity to pair Nissa of Trocken with the War Doctor. Nissa of Trocken is 3 and a blue for a legendary creature human scientist, a 3-4 with you have no maximum hand size, Doctor's Companion, and Sonic Booster. Whenever Nissa of Trocken attacks, sacrifice X artifacts. When you sacrifice one or more artifacts this way, tap up to X darker creatures and you draw to X cards. I really liked the way Nissa looked, and I tried to start brewing around with her in a more casual deck after I had built the CDH version. The CDH version was fun, but I really, really wanted to just kind of go crazy with it and see what was the most that I could potentially build and what were the most possible cards I could potentially draw. Now, eventually I wound up in Teamer pairing her with the Fugitive Doctor, who does a whole lot less. She does provide a really nice clue token, which can be eaten up by Nissa later on, so that's pretty cool. By going into Teamer, I was able to access a lot of potential treasure makers, food makers, and clue makers. And this wound up being a pretty potent deck that I have enjoyed playing to death. It should be getting a little bit of a highlight in an episode of a top secret project that some other folks in Commander Cookout Media Group are working on. Be sure to stay tuned for that. I have really enjoyed this one. It actually led to me obsessing over a particular card, something that you'll see is a bit of a recurring theme in a lot of these decks I'm going to talk about today. Now, speaking of decks that I've really enjoyed from CDH, bringing lessons from that metagame into regular Commander, the next one I want to talk about is the combination of Silas Wren and Rebecca. 
So Silas is the blue and black partner that most commander players are familiar with. 2-2 uh, two -two with Death Touch for one blue and a black. Legendary artifact creature human with Death Touch and partner. And whenever Silas deals combat damage to a player, choose target artifact card in your graveyard. You may cast that card this turn. Well, after I talked to DJ Yavamaya with his brew on Temeshi Reality Architect, I decided it would be kind of cool to try to brew in that space myself. So I partnered Silas Ren with Rebecca, Architect of Ascension. Rebecca is a legendary creature, human artificer, a 3-4 with artifacts you control have protection from each converted mana value among artifacts you control and partner. So between these two, we get into Esper, which are kind of the traditional artifact colors. And I wanted to try to build a deck where almost everything wound up being a permanent. And I managed to do it, building into a deck that every card was a permanent. Constantly getting back cards that I've channeled with Silas Ren's ability. Building in some other effects like Hall of Heliod's Generosity to also get back enchantments. And then some fun stuff like having the Mycosynth Lattice and similar effects in there so that all my cards were artifacts and all my cards had protection. Making it a very hard deck to block and also a hard deck to interact with. That said, this has been an experiment that has not always gone perfectly. I'm sure there's more things I can do to improve on this deck, and I consider it to be a work in progress. Now, one of the decks that has been near and dear to my heart for a number of years now is a deck that I built after looking at what mono green players were doing with Selvala, Heart of the Wild, in CDH. And that is Galta, Primal Hunger. Galta is 12 mana, 10 green green for a 12-12 legendary creature Elder Dinosaur with Trample, and Galta costs X less to cast, where X is the total power of creatures you control. What made Galta so interesting was, and unlike having Silvala in the command zone, I was able to try to build around the idea that my command zone was just a ritual that I could use. In mono green, you can sacrifice Galta to greater good to draw 12 cards, discard 3. That seems pretty good. You also have potential ritual effects like Silvala, where you tap, add 12 green mana to your mana pool, and there's a lot you can probably do with it. Usually the deck is going to try to storm off by sacrificing Galta or exploiting Galta's 12 power in some other way. Rishkar's Expertise is a favorite, 6 mana to draw 12 cards and then put something with a mana value 5 or less directly into play. Very nice. Or even just casting Life's Legacy for 1 and a green to sacrifice Galta and draw 12 cards. That's pretty nice too. Galta is one of my all-time favorite decks, and it's a deck that I have been working hard on over the years, and it got some new toys in Modern Horizons 3. It's not often we get an effect that lets us sacrifice a creature to draw cards in green, especially not when it's just based on power. It has been an effect they've gone back to more and more. And Disciple of Freylace, the modal double-faced land that you could play as a land untapped just for bolting yourself... Oh, I don't even care that it costs six mana to do it. It is phenomenal, and I was so happy to see it printed in Modern Horizons 3. Now, the next deck I want to talk about is one you can probably check out on episode 434 of Commander Cookout Podcast, and that is my Yadar, Ghoul Caller of Nefalia deck. This was an experiment where I was trying to see what could I do building entirely with Uncommons. Because Yadar enabled me to very quickly get a very reliable source of expendable tokens into play. Yadar is one in a black for a 1-1 legendary creature human wizard with, at the beginning of your end step, if you control no creatures with Decayed, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token with Decayed. Decayed just means that if it attacks, it is sacrificed at the end of combat. Or, you can't block with it. Not a whole lot more than that. It's really cool that you have a reliable source of repeatable token generation. And... In black, there are so many different cards that have, as an additional cost, sacrifice a creature, which make cards that are normally very hard to use or effects that are hard to get in black a lot easier to access and a lot cheaper than they would be otherwise. Be sure to check out Brando and Ryan on episode 434 of Commander Cookout where they go deep on this particular deck. And yes, you can build it for under 25 bucks. The next deck I want to talk about is one of my personal favorites, and another deck that was inspired by a CDH deck. In CDH, there is a mono-white deck which uses Teshar, Ancestor's Apostle, as essentially a Quark Clan Ironworks deck. It is super cool and kind of amazing what people were able to do with it. And while I really like Teshar, I thought it might be more interesting to look at a different potential commander in the command zone. And the one that I chose was God Eternal Oketra. Now, if you're interested in cards that look this nice, I picked this up on the Facebook Altar Auctions on the Commander Cookout Facebook group. Be sure to check those out every Thursday. 
Ryan does some amazing work, and I was really happy to get this nice upgrade for the deck. God Eternal Oketra is 3 white white for a 3-6 legendary creature zombie god with double strike, and whenever you cast a creature spell, create a 4-4 black zombie warrior creature token with vigilance. And when God Eternal Oketra dies or is put into exile from the battlefield, you may put it in its owner's library, third from the top. God Eternal Oketra, in this case, rather than representing an engine piece like Tishar, represented an output, a way to actually get value out of all of that recycling, the same kind of build in this deck was going to do. I'm running a lot of the same pieces like Scrap Trawler, Mirror Retriever, Junk Diver, and Sacrifice Outlets like Phyrexian Altar, like Crock Clan Ironworks, like Ashnod's Altar. These are powerful effects that can very quickly go infinite. And what God Eternal Catcher allows me to do with this deck is to go ahead and just generate an unbounded number of 4-4 zombies. I felt that this was really well tuned for more low power games because even if I managed to establish one of those endless loops and make unbounded zombies, I specifically chose to build a deck in such a way that there were no haste enablers, which are not easy to get in mono white anyway. This means that even if I did the loop, I could then look around the table and pass the turn around and people had one round of the table to deal with an unstoppable horde of zombies. This deck has been a ton of fun and shout out to Lara in the nation, who I know is another big fan of Scrappy Cat as we've come to call her. The final deck I'm going to talk about is one that I've talked about as an example in a lot of episodes of Gemstone Mine over the years, and that is Trelasara Moon Dancer. Trelasara is one in a green for a 2-2 legendary creature elf cleric with whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on Trelasara and scry one. For me, this represented an opportunity to take a lot of what I've learned from other CDH decks and specifically what I learned trying to build an old Karlov of the Ghost Council deck years ago. Soul Sisters have always been a deck I've kind of enjoyed. I actually had a Soul Sisters deck put together for Modern a few years ago. But Trelasara allowed me to take a lot of those same lessons that I learned in other formats like Modern and apply them to Commander. Specifically, Trelasara being able to act as both a card filtering engine, where anytime I gained life, I could scry the top part of my library, either to keep it on top if it's one that I needed, or stick it down on the bottom if it's one that I really didn't want to see. It made for a lot of interesting decision making. It also meant there was always a card available for me to pressure my opponent's life totals and to be the threat at the table. Personally, I don't like games where people are just sitting around staring at each other and not wanting to make the first move. I like to bring this deck to Command Fest and other blind metagames and just be the threat. I want to establish that this is the game I want to play. I want lots of interaction. I'm going to encourage you by putting a big, big commander coming right at you. To that end, the scrying serves another wonderful purpose, where if we're playing a game that really should keep going, it's not ready to end yet, it's very easy for me to scry one of the effects that gives Trelasar evasion, usually in the form of trample, to the bottom of my library. Whereas if it's time for the game to end, I can start digging to try to find one of those trample effects to quickly and succinctly end the game. Trelasara is one of my forever decks. She comes with me to just about every Command Fest and Magic Fest that I go to. And hopefully I'll be able to bring it with me when I come see everybody at Vegas this year. And those are the decks I wanted to talk about. Those aren't all of my decks, and certainly I didn't dip into my CDH pool at all for this, because I wanted to illustrate just how much you can take from CDH in order to build decks that you intend to fit in that classic Battle Cruiser format that we all know and love. What about you? Are there some decks that you took from CDH or even just bits and pieces of engines that you were using that you wanted to make your own in a more casual game? Let us know about it in the comments. We are on YouTube as part of Commander Cookout Media Group. Or you can let us know via email where we are gemstonemindpodcast at gmail.com. And finally, you can still reach us on Twitter where we are at gemstonemindmtg. Until next time, I'm John and this is Gemstone Mind.